All right, come on. So let's welcome our leaders uh, in IoT. Thank you. Number five, one. Oh, I'm sitting next to you. <laughs> Four. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Everybody in your proper spots. Contestant number one. <laughs> okay. Oh, wait, no. <laughs> <laughs> so once again, uh, these are all of the leaders of our IoT and IOE activities that you guys have heard so much about. Um, I'm going to have each of them introduce themselves in less than a minute, and then we'll get into our questions, and then and again, get your questions ready as well. So, John? Hi, I'm the, my name is John Apostolopoulos. I'm the CTO for the enterprise segment, and I also lead an innovation labs uh, in Cisco. And as part of the innovation labs, we put a lot of effort invested in, in developing some of the, uh, the technologies that will enable IOE. In particular, as part of this work, I've worked very closely with all of my colleagues on the side here to identify what are the key problems, build some of these technologies, and test them out in POCs. Things like fog computing, uh, data analytics at the edge of the network, light as a service, and so forth. And hopefully you're you have some questions on these topics, and I'll be happy to talk more about it later. Great. Maciek? My name is Maciek Kran. So whatever questions you have, please ask uh, John. Um, I run the corporate technology group. Uh, we focus on what are the major uh, disruptions that are um, ahead of us over the next couple of years and how we accelerate and turn them into <laughs> business opportunities. From the IoT perspective, uh, we focus on uh, innovation, uh, focusing on uh, efforts around co-innovation with our partners, customers, uh, with innovation centers, uh, grand challenges, and so forth. So our focus is more on the Horizon 3. I'm Kip Compton. I run our IoT systems and software business. Good afternoon. My name is Wim Elfrink. Um, I'm a strong believer in the opportunities of IoT, IOE. Uh, I have the opportunity to lead it for the last decade, um, specifically focusing initially on smart cities. I'm extremely excited and thrilled to see you all here as believers in this opportunity. It's new target addressable market. Uh, it, it's a new opportunity for Cisco, for the industry, and for developers. Great, thank you. Great. And hi, uh, I'm Tony Shakib. I run the uh, IOE verticals and solutions. And basically what my team does is we take all the great technology from Cisco and our partners and we package it in a way that's consumable for our customers and solves a real business outcome. Great. So as you can see, we have all the heavy hitters in IoT from across Cisco right here on stage. So uh, let me start out with a few questions. So first of all, IoT and IOE, is it real? Or is it hype? So, anybody want to jump in? Machik, anything to say start. about that? So, how many of you think it's it's real? Which one? IoT. Hi. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 who do you think? Who thinks it's just hype? Perfect. So our job is done. <laughs> um, so let me maybe start with my perspective. Um, it is great to see that uh, that IoT actually is uh, sort of on the top of a hype curve. Um, you know, if you look at uh, startups, for example, suddenly over the last two years, uh, most of the startups in the Valley suddenly became IoT startups. So whatever they were doing now, they have IoT on them. Uh, but a lot of hype in my, my mind has been around uh, kind of a B2C, so home and so forth. And even though we are seeing a lot of uh, very interesting IoT applications that are starting to happen in a home around the elder, elderly care, around security and so forth, my sense is that, um, that uh, in a B2C environment, uh, the best, most, most disruptive uh, innovations are yet to come. But if I think about what's real and what is today is B2B. And um, I'm sure I'm, uh, my colleagues will uh, jump in here, but when you think about it, we've been doing uh, B2B and B2B2C over the last uh, five to seven years. We have over 10,000 customers uh, that have deployed our IoT architectures. Pretty much, if you look at this, uh, uh, I would say uh, everybody in a Fortune 1000 manufacturing space, for example. So in the areas of discrete manufacturing, online gas, transportation, smart cities, um, smart grid, uh, definitely we are seeing uh, the implementations that are real, whether they are remote monitoring and management, whether they are around uh, preventive maintenance and so forth. So the good news is that there's a lot of hype. The good news also is that um, there, there is a real business, multi-billion dollar opportunities happening today. 
Anybody else? Tony, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think from my perspective, you. you know, if you think about IoT, IOE, at the end of the day, you know, there's people and there's assets. And assets fall into three broad categories, right? You've got buildings, you know, you got things that are moving like cars, trucks, buses. And then you got like physical little assets, you know, sensors, actuators, things that you connect to. So in many places, the enterprises, the B2B and the, or the B2B to C that, uh, you know, Magic was talking about, you know, we've been able to successfully demonstrate that whenever you connect these assets, collect the analytics, bring it back, you know, those insights will enable you, you know, for the most part to drive a much higher degree of efficiency out of those assets. Now, it's just a matter of like, where do you start? And where I really uh, do agree with Magic is that on the consumer side, the value that you might generate, it might be hard to monetize, but on the business side, especially the heavy industries, where they got very expensive assets, you know, it's like an x-ray machine, millions of dollars, and every minute that it's sitting there un underutilized, that's loss of revenue, or if it's a jet engine, or whatever that you could imagine. So any way that you could connect them, you know, you could manage them better, you could predict when bad things are gonna happen and you avoid that and you get better efficiency out of it. I mean, that's really what IoT and IOE is all about. And we have hundreds of successful use cases where we demonstrate the value. And, uh, you know, I'm obviously a big proponent and I think that trend is gonna continue. Great, thank you. Uh, so, Wim, I have a question for you, which is, uh, what are Cisco's aspirations for IoT and IOE developers? Um, you know, we talk about an overall value at stake for the industry um, of 19 trillion in the next decade. These are numbers that are very hard to, to absorb and to understand what it is. Uh, but I, I really think what the big differentiation is, is the business to business at the industrial side of the house. And we used to physical assets, uh, but what we're now doing is that everything is going to be connected at uh, the things. And so some people here are probably chief things officers. And at all the things that you're going to connect in your company. And at this moment, we connect 300,000 things an hour, 30 million a week, 2.3 billion sensors shipped last week. Everything that you connect to the internet lights up and start producing data. And I think that the data, how can you make it information? How can you make it knowledge? How can you make it wisdom? And, and here now, that it's industrial companies, cities are very siloed. And you have a department for water. You have a department for a smart grid. You have a department for traffic. And you know what they don't do? They don't talk together. It was too complex. But now where you start combining things via data and you create a virtual digital overlay, think about what's happening with Uber, a company four years old, being worth $40 billion of market capitalization. And who doesn't want to have that in his city? I had this morning a press conference with Kansas City and they are really going out to look. Hey, it's a physical city. How can we build a digital overlay? and also start combining IT and OT, and operational technology. And for, you know, OT and IT never talked in the past. And so if you think about a digital overlay, and you think then about industrial applications, an open world for developers, and that some people say at this moment, that it's early days, but in three to five years, it could be 10% of Cisco's revenue. That that's coming from a developer's world and applications that you can share, and then not these apps that you have on your phone, that's fine. And that's in, uh, you know, that we, we think in general that, that people spend two hours a day now on apps. I think my kids six hours a day, by the way, and I don't know what, what you think, uh, but now that whole industrial magic already elaborated, and Tony talked about it, uh, if we get that industrial world as a new target to go after via a digital overlay, and then a $5 billion business, I think, in three to five years. And this is aspirational. Huh? That, uh, yep, not in the press, that's what Wim said. You know, it's an aspiration. And it's something, as an industry, we're shaping together. Uh, but just dream a little bit out of the box. 
and think about what happened six years ago with the simple consumer apps. 15,000 apps a week coming to the market. Now the industrial side, what an opportunity, Susie. Yes. And maybe I can just add uh, what, what you mentioned, which is, you know, I talked to a lot of startups and, uh, um, and obviously a lot of developers as well. And I think, Wim, what you mentioned, uh, one thing I think is very important, which is um, my advice is don't focus on we will be another platform. Focus on what is the vertical use case you're going to solve. Uh, each of these verticals that we mentioned are multi-billion dollar opportunities. So um, you don't have to say, I'll be the IoT platform for X or Y. If you so focus on one use case, it's a huge opportunity for startups or for large companies. And one, down the road, I think, if you start moving from one use case, one industry, to maybe a similar use case in another industry, you can start building the platform. But so don't start with the platform out, start with the use case in. Yep, great. Uh, for Kip, if I may uh, ask, so the same question is IoT hyper real, and also you're creating products in this area, so why don't you tell us yeah. about some of the things you're doing to help us make it real? Sure, so um, IoT is definitely real. Um, I think we've covered that. You know, I made my comment about which one because actually the most frequent question I get when talking to people is, what's the difference between IoT and IOE? Um, so. I'll guess that might be one of the first questions that we'll get if they ask, when we have that opportunity. IoT is connecting things, um, and we realized at Cisco a number of years ago that just connecting the things to the network, though, as exciting as that was, wasn't really going to change the world, wasn't really going to generate the business outcomes that we're talking about up here. And we realized that in addition to connecting those things, you have to connect it with data, as Wim was describing, but also with people and the way they work and with processes that, you know, whether they're industrial processes or business processes. So IOE is really an umbrella term that includes Internet of Things, but then all the other things you need to do to take advantage of Internet thing, of Things. I think of IoT as kind of the spark that makes IOE happen. Um, now, in terms of what we're doing to make it real, I mean, as you probably surmised from our conversation up here, a lot of our strategy is focused on industrial and commercial and, and public sector applications of this technology. Um, we're less active in the consumer or in the smart home, although we do do work with a bunch of our service provider partners uh, to enable that market. Um, so, you know, some very basic products and things that Cisco has includes, you know, I like to say exactly what you'd expect from Cisco, which is a set of networking products that work in these challenging environments, you know, in factories, in transportation, in mines, uh, 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 oil fields, all kinds of different environments. But there's some exciting capabilities that we built on top of those um, that I think of our particular interest to developers, and, and really there's two in particular. As we started doing IoT deployments a number of years ago, we realized that there were some new challenges. In particular, the cloud approach didn't always work. So we developed something called Fog Computing in our IOX platform, uh, which, developer, which enables you as developers to write software that runs in our hardened networking equipment at the edge of the network with special APIs that you have access to information in that environment. We have a number of partners, I think about a dozen at this point, who have ported their software to that environment and, and done interesting deployments in this area. The other is a technology called Data in Motion, and actually there's a demonstration over there. You check out the Hello World demo, you can see Data in Motion at the center of that, which is actually a rules engine that runs at the edge of the network that you can program to take data from sensors and execute rules. This is very helpful because it works even if the wide area network's not connected. So, you know, we're building a, a business at Cisco in these industrial and commercial segments along with public sector and smart cities. And I think there's some exciting things that we'd love for you to check out and, you know, ideally develop code or give us feedback on while you're here. Excellent. Uh, so, John. If we were to uh, you know, take some of the things that Kip and that the others have talked about, how would you actually, for example, deploy IoT in this building here? Ah, okay, so that's a great question. <laughs> so these buildings, as well as like the uh, cities, and, uh, which include libraries and hospitals and so forth, these are wonderful places where we can enhance the, the, uh, uh, the experience of people who are entering those places as well as workers. So for example, over here, one of the key things that's very useful is location-based services, for you to know where you are and to help you get from point A to point B. 
It's clear in convention centers you need that. In hospitals you need that really too, because the patients need to go from wherever they are in their room to take their x-ray to the doctor and so forth. This can massively improve uh, the experience for, for patients. Also, from a hospital's point of view, by the way, that saves a lot of wasted OPEX in terms of the buffers they have to have to, to ensure they can still treat a patient by leaving some buffer in case they get lost and so forth. So that's hugely valuable. In places like this, too, um, there are quite a number of different networks. There's an electrical network to, to power the lights. There are thermostats, heat and air conditioning. There's surveillance. There's physical security access and so forth. There is data for your uh, Wi-Fi devices and so forth, and your voice over IP phones. Today, all those are different networks. Can you believe that? Everything I just mentioned is a different network. Think about what can happen in terms of simplicity and repairability and so forth if we can merge all of those together on a smaller number of networks. Cisco did that before merging data and voice, and then video, and now we're trying to do it with this large number of other networks that exist here. As a concrete example, we all know about how LEDs are really taken off in terms of replacing uh, incandescent and fluorescent lighting. Well, LEDs can actually be powered often at 15 or 30 volts, so you can power them with PoE. That means you can connect an LED a light bulb, and this is things that Tony Shakib's and Wim's team are working heavily on, LED light bulbs with PoE to both uh, control the lighting and to exchange messages back and forth and so forth. And this actually reduces massively the cost because you don't need um, high voltage electrical wiring and you don't need an electrician to set it up. One set of cabling uh, to do everything. So these are some examples of things that we can do in environments like this. And these things that I mentioned, most of those things you, we can do today. And even more things in the, the pipe or planet for the future. Yeah, it's really amazing how just over the last year, I would say, going from hype to reality has really come through in many areas. I have more questions here, but do we have any questions from the audience? Okay. Yep, up here, uh, we need a microphone to come up here. It's coming. No, 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 he needs. <laughs> <laughs> so where do you guys see the biggest opportunity in the, the development of IoT in the automation robotics for manufacturing? I know there's been a, a bunch of things Cisco has done trying to get sensors and, and to what some of you guys had said about uh, measuring things closest to the end point. <laughs> but, um, you know, coming from a big manufacturer, you know, what is some of the stuff that we could really see in the future to help speed up and reduce OPEX? And, and, um, yeah, <clears throat> great question. So uh, there's actually a lot of exciting stuff happening in the manufacturing world right now. Uh, we're working with a lot of the robot makers, right? And actually what a lot of them want to do is to start running these robots as a service. Instead of selling it and forgetting about it, right? They want to be able to make sure that they're connected to these things, they can maximize the operation and the experience, right? And provide it as a service. So it's a new business model for them. You look at it, the factories, factories are in the business of building things. They don't necessarily want to spend a lot of their time making sure that everything's operating and their biggest enemy is downtime. So you know in an auto plant when like a part of the plant goes down, the entire operation comes to a halt. So what, if you connect it, if you can monitor the behavior, if you can look at vibrations, you can predict when things are happening, you know, and reduce that. Again, some of these uh, robot makers that we're working on, they're working on a project called ZDT, Zero Downtime. Very exciting. And wherever we have implemented that joint solution with them, they've been able to run these things, you know, at uh, for a very long time without a single incident. They can predict when things are going to happen, and then in the maintenance time they can fix it. Right now they can run it as a service. They can now start enhancing that experience with the people that are operating it, you know, to make sure that they have the right level of skill sets. When something does break down. Sometimes these things are in remote areas, right? They don't know who to send, what parts to send. With the sensors, you can actually know exactly what happened, what went wrong, you know? Like the metro subway system in New York. I know it's not manufacturing, but they run it like manufacturing, and when things, remote things, you know, they can do remote diagnostics, figure out what's going on. So, you know, this whole manufacturing space, 
I think we're just right at the beginning of it. There's a lot of innovation that is going to start to happen. A lot of the new business models that will emerge. And all of that really requires, number one, connectivity. And number two, equally important, if not more, security. Right? Because they have a lot of people going in and out of these plants, different contractors. So they want to make sure that you know, they can segment access, who's logging in, who's accessing these equipment. And, and managing them. And uh, just to add a little bit more to that, if we, uh, I'm just going to point to a couple of things over there in the DevNet zone. There's some DevNet innovation showing, a, you know, just some uh, early innovations around uh, working in a manufacturing scenario, where uh, first that plant operator has a floor map view, being uh, mapped with location, but of course knowing where the different machinery is into the system. As you get closer. The robotic arm, you know, to a robotic arm, then you can start to control it as you get close to it, as an operator would. Or you lift it up, and then you start to see augmented information overlaid onto it, as opposed to going back and pulling out the manuals and issues like that. So these are like small things that uh, can, you know, greatly improve operational efficiency, and it's just using technologies that are available today. So go take a look at some of those demos there. Susie, can I? Can I I want to give one simple example. Uh, Maciek talked about use cases. And so almost all countries in the world are currently working on uh, border access. What can you do with telemetry, uh, with things to automate? And uh, a bloody irritating thing uh, is when you enter a country and you stand there with your passport in a queue. And uh, you know, DMV and all these types of uh, with things you can solve that. Uh, but here's an example that so um, in Dubai, uh, that telemetry passport control is now 100% automated. And um, iris scan, and you know, in, in, in a couple of seconds, you enter the country and it, it, it's safe. But then you come in a hotel. What is the first thing that they do to you? They ask you for your passport. And it takes around 10 minutes to register. And, and so if you have that use case, and, and then you make that use case later horizontal, and if cities, if countries pass out their data, and think about it, 10 million visitors a year, saving 10 minutes for 10 million, that's 100 million of minutes that you save by one simple use case. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, manufacturing, public sector, and that utilities in general, and that are for us the big first targets to go after, and we have identified 61 use cases I'd be more than happy to share with you. And because then when you have solved that use case and you start then sharing that data and you make it horizontally, that's where the new revenues, the asset management improvement and the productivity improvements stick in. And uh, just uh, one other thing you were asking about robots and uh, you know robotics. So we actually have two DevNet IoT partners right over here. We have iRobot and we have Sci-Fi Works, which has drones. And so if you take a look at what can happen with IoT and drones, then now you have an ability to actually have mobile sensors or take mobile action based on what's being sensed. So that adds a whole other dimension of things that uh, can be solved with new, new tools here. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. Please wait for the microphone. It's coming. I can help. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, in the domain of IoT, I'm understanding there's like three levels. One's like uh, the enablers, which is the underlying technology. There's a middle level, which is the, the engagers. And those are the ones that develop the, the products and solutions for IoT. And then there's the enhancers, which are really the value-added services uh, on that whole platform. But where does Cisco fit in that value chain? Yep. I, I, I can take a stab at it. Okay. I think that's a great question. Uh, so here's the strategy for Cisco. First of all, we don't make sensors, nor do we intend to. But we work very closely with all the companies that do. We have a whole generation of networking equipment gateways that uh, Kip and his team uh, develop ruggedized that go into these environments or non-ruggedized from traditional Cisco that we've had that essentially connects to all these devices, ingests the data. Then you bring all the data in and right now we have the capabilities to do both ingest that data into a Cisco cloud and move it around or work with any other third party in case they want to have a hybrid approach. And then the third layer 
you know, is where you said where you actually build the applications. And we have some capabilities applications that we've developed ourselves, like in the area of collaboration, video conferencing, that's our heritage. Many of those applications we can bring forward and integrate it into that experience or also have an open development community, which is what DevNet's all about, to invite our partners, ISVs, innovators, startups to come and build applications on top of it. So it's a very flexible architecture. It really depends on what the customer wants, what's best suited for them, and that's kind of like where we play. But we don't really play deep into the sensors or into the applications. We're kind of like that piece in the middle. Maybe just to add what Tony said, uh, you know, we, we, we often make this statement that um, no one company can do it alone, right? Um, and the capability that Tony described, and by the way, we invested around billion dollars in these capabilities over the last two years, uh, is to enable us uh, uh, to have a flexible engagement model with the customers and partners. So in some cases, we would, for example, offer services for the, for the solution because that's what customers are asking. In some cases, one of our partners will do that, right? So um, in some way, uh, the core capabilities around products around the platform are sort of a given, but the, the rest of the capabilities depend on the use case and on the customer engagement. Yep. So, uh, you know, one, one key shift that has happened is, you know, many of you, uh, you know, many people in the past have thought of Cisco as providing really stove type solutions, only use Cisco and things like that. But there is a shift in that there's a definite understanding that it's the solution and that we need a broader ecosystem to really solve these things. And you can actually see it very much in the way everybody's talking, but that's truly uh, a cultural change that has happened within Cisco. Uh, and even just the fact that we have DevNet here, you know, that we've created DevNet as a developer program in the last year and a half, is actually an, a testament to the fact that we're embracing the broader ecosystem and to make anything real that's what, that's what we need. So uh, more of our platforms are trying to be more plug and play and extensible so that we can add sensors from different manufacturers, apply things to different verticals, and that's where we need help from all of you. Um, another question uh, in here is, you know, you guys, what are we doing, you know, beyond DevNet, what kinds of things are we doing to help enable developers? Machik, any thoughts there? Sure. Um, so. We actually firmly believe, as, as Susie mentioned, that uh, um, IoT is based on the model of co-innovation. Uh, so from that perspective, in addition to the internal capabilities that we discussed also, uh, we've been developing capabilities to work with you. DevNet is obviously one example. But, but also it's a realization that um, innovation in IoT is global, and we need to be innovating not only where we happen to be, but also where our customers and partners um, are. So from that perspective, uh, we've been uh, putting together the uh, network of innovation centers. We've announced uh, nine of those centers so far, uh, but there will be more coming. And uh, uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of innovation centers. If you haven't, perfect. Okay, so a handful of you, perfect. If you haven't, please go to a Cisco website and uh, you will get the list of those. But um, uh, the concept here is, that um, let's say there's an innovation center that is uh, being built in Berlin, there's one in London, uh, Barcelona, uh, there's one in, uh, in um, Toronto, uh, uh, Japan, and so forth. Uh, but each of these centers uh, focus on a specific vertical. So for example, the um, uh, center in Berlin is focusing on transportation and uh, manufacturing. And uh, each of the centers has three areas of focus. One is around showcase, the second one is around solution development in this area uh, the center teams are, are joined to the hip with Tony and the solution teams. And the third one is around investments and around research, um, investments with uh, startups, accelerators, but also joining forces with uh, universities uh, where we sponsor jointly efforts, for example, around FOG. So uh, the reason I mention this, and we also run things like grand challenges. We, we ran a couple of grand challenges around security which we haven't touched on yet, but uh, I'm sure this will be the, uh, one of the topics you will uh, bring up soon. Um, but in general, I would really encourage you to look at these uh, centers as a potential areas where we can get together with, with you as developers or, or customers or partners and start developing solutions jointly. Great. 
Can I, you know, again, I, I like to talk in examples. And that, so this morning uh, we had an, uh, a transport session uh, and we talked about uh, also manufacturing in transportation. So in our uh, innovation center in Berlin, uh, together with Bosch, uh, we developed, and it, it sounds so simple, a, a connected screwdriver. If you go to the airplane business, uh, I'm not allowed to give the name of, uh, but they make very big planes. Um, every, every of these planes has 400,000 screws. At the moment, you have to measure the torque uh, that because it has to be registered for uh, safety for uh, the planes. And it's a very simple use case again. Yes. And that it's now an, uh, a screwdriver a torque that is connected uh, as a thing to the internet. And so instead of driving a screw in, measuring the torque, write it in a log, type it in a system, be able then to secure it and to license it, it it's now a closed process. And it's 400,000 screws a plane. And it improves safety, and it makes these type of things so simple. Yep, it's amazing how many uh, painful things that people just work around and accept as the status quo, yep. but can be easily improved with digitiz digitalization. Great, do we have another question from the audience? Oh, lots. Oh, there you go. Okay, <laughs> uh, okay we've got one in the back. Uh, in your expectation, how long it takes to transfer the IoT from early adoption uh, market to a mature uh, market o over all the world? Great question. So first, the question is that what is the definition of a mature market? <laughs> and, that's, uh, and Wim, you've been uh, working on this for 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're, we're part way into that. Yeah. Now don't forget IoT, and it, as it, the, the terminology was coined in 1998. And that it, it had all to do with RFID, but it never took off. I think at the moment, and that where we ship 300,000 things an hour, at a 30 billion, and we start thinking it's getting exponential. And where things get exponential, and the business becomes mature. And what Magic said, 10% of venture capitalist money at the moment in the valley is going in startups of things. And I, I think uh, we, and uh, also in Cisco, we, we see that we're currently at an inflection point and that we have to go from uh, an early adapters team to scale. Uh, it is now getting pervasive. Uh, it's a sub substantial business if you count it all up. And so I think in the next three to five years, it's going to be a mature industry. The biggest impediment uh, to have one of those hairy things on the table is going to be security. And that if you just, in, the, in your enterprise company, uh, because don't forget, IoT has to be connected to the application. That's already complex enough. Uh, but then the third dimension, it has to go to ERP systems. So every CIO, you know, that is just frightened about security. And so KIP has to really think horizontally, <laughs> architecturally, yeah. and it from, from a security point of view. But don't forget, so at the moment, if we ask CEOs and CIOs, the big two things, the CEOs will say, what will digitalization at IOE, IoT do to my company? Am I going to be the next Kodak? And at a company that invented photography. We all agree that photography is completely digitized. And the company who invented it, with 135,000 people, went bankrupt in 2012. And so it's going to be extremely disruptive. And so all CEOs say, what is IoT, IOE, digitalization going to do to my company? And every CIO is worried and says, what does security mean for me? How vulnerable am I? And what are my risks? And I think in the end, those two things will determine whether it is next year, three years, five years, it's absolutely the horizon, it is exponential, and it enables new business models, like I said, Uber, but all these shared economy type of new companies and that are a digital overlay. You know, in four years, building a company of 40 billion market capitalization and scaling to more than 130 places in the world. Uber was the first company that has unified Europe in a strike. <laughs> but think about the disruption.
And those type of things are on the horizon. I'm absolutely sure that there are some people here in this audience who already are working on that bright idea yeah. and will be the next big developers. Skip. So there's one, there's, there's one thing I'll add. Yeah. Uh, I think there's the macro view, which I think Wim just articulated incredibly well. I've, we see patterns though at the micro level, so yeah. it's, it's uh, very unevenly distributed. You can go find some industries that are already taking huge advantage of these technologies to significant effect, and other industries that are walking around with a clipboard and a, a legal pad uh, uh, and are far, far behind. And what we've seen is there's usually sort of a killer app, um, and that sometimes it's dictated by regulatory uh, reasons, sometimes it's a strong financial thing where uh, uh, labor is more expensive and it's easier to deploy the technologies. Sometimes it's a safety use case. Often it's a pro proactive maintenance, as Tony was describing. Those business cases almost always work. But we typically see a customer or a vertical find a killer app that justifies deploying the platform and the infrastructure that they need to do IoT. They have to put in a network. Maybe it's yet another network, as John was describing, but they have to put in an IP network to connect these things. Once we do that, we usually see it take off because they realize once they've got that first app that, made, that had a positive ROI or was required for a regulatory reason in place, the infrastructure's there, and they think of 10 more things that now make a lot of sense because they can leverage the infrastructure that's there that didn't make sense before. So, you know, Wim described it as exponential. I think I see lots of little exponentials in different industries in different parts of the world because there are also regional differences in the economics and in, in the regulations. So, I think to understand it, you have to look at, at kind of a micro level as well. Maybe I can add to this as well. Uh, in many industries, it's not a question of technology because technology exists. It's a question of change management and, and organizational and behavior. Uh, many of the industries we talked about, whether this is uh, manufacturing or transportation, been operating kind of in a certain way for dozens of years. And now IoT comes in as a big disruption. Disruption moving from uh, proprietary or specialized technologies into open systems and IP. Convergence of IT and OT from the organizational perspective. So in many ways, the maturity of the industry is not only the function of technology, but also the function of, of the industries changing their business models um, and uh, organizationally people embracing open systems. And that actually may take longer period of time than the technology readiness itself. Great. Next question. Should come up front here. Yes, run before. Hi, so. uh, can you speak to the future of fog computing? It uh, seems like you guys initially started off with bring your own device. Now, as security threats are continuing to increase, can you talk about maybe some event correlation at the network edge or whatever your vision is, please? I think John would love to talk about that. <laughs> sure. As well uh, as many others. So Yeah, many of us are working together on this. Uh, what happens just to make sure, first of all, who here has, has heard of fog computing? Okay, great, most of you have heard of it. Uh, just as a quick thing, for those who haven't, today we do a lot of computing on the device and in the data center in the cloud. But in many applications, you don't have the, the bandwidth to get to the cloud or you don't have, or the latency is too high and so forth. And that's why you want to do compute storage and networking at the edge of the network. And that's how we call fog, because we take some of the capability in the cloud, bring it at the edge. Um, what happens is we're investing quite heavily in terms of figuring out, in terms of developing the platforms and the applications and some of the analytics that can run at the edge to enable a variety of applications in, in many different verticals. Um, one example which you can also see here is where we do video, uh, visual analytics at the edge. So as you know, uh, our vision system is incredibly powerful and we use it to understand the world and so forth. It's very hard for... Uh, uh, Vision contains a huge amount of data. As soon as you have a variety of cameras, regular optical cameras, IR, uh, high dynamic range, all these different things, they, require, they produce a lot of data and you can't get them off and all that data to the cloud. So you want to do the processing locally. We actually have a demo about 20 yards from here where it shows you some of the different things you can do with video analytics at, at the edge of the network to, uh, to empower a variety of different applications. Um, Kip, your team is working quite heavily on FOB too. Would you like to share some of the, the work there? 
Yeah, sure. I mean, we, um, this was what, 15 months ago that we launched um, the IOX platform. And um, actually, it was a relatively small launch by Cisco standards, but got a huge amount of attention. And I think since the day that was launched, the team uh, uh, has seen just sort of accelerating interest in this, in this concept. Um, what we're doing is, is sort of maybe what you'd expect. I mean, instead of the Horizon 2 stuff that, that John was talking about, but we're busy adding more and more platforms that support our FOG uh, computing environment so that developers who write software can run that software in more environments. Um, and we're busy improving the FOG platform so it has more APIs and more capabilities based on the feedback uh, that we're getting from developers. And it, it's sort of interesting because, you know, the pendulum, if, if you look at the history of, of the IT industry, the pendulum has swung sort of back and forth between centralized computing and distributed, you know, it mainframes, then we had PCs. Now actually the cloud is an incredibly centralized architecture if you look at it. Fog computing is sort of like pendulum swinging back a little bit. I think what's really interesting this time and one of the reasons we're seeing it take off is that there are robust software containers available that make it easy to move applications between cloud and fog or between uh, fog nodes. So that's some of the things that, that we're working on. Um, as John mentioned, actually, our shipping video cameras can now run fog applications. So we have uh, a great example of, of this type of thing is uh, a partner who wrote license plate uh, detection and identification code that actually runs on the surveillance camera. So now the surveillance camera, in addition to being able to send a stream of video, which takes a lot of bandwidth, is also a license plate sensor and sends a stream of license plates, which takes very little information. So we're, we're seeing the fog computing helping turn video into sort of an uber sensor that you can use to sense lots of different things in the environment. So there's, there's a lot of creativity there. Excellent. You know, if I can just add to that, one of the things that's really cool is, you know, there's the whole what IoT does for businesses to transform them, and then there's what FOG does to IoT, right? We, I had my team out in TechEd uh, last week, or the week before, and the number one thing that came back from manufacturing, the requirement that they're looking for is virtualization. A lot of these assembly lines, we looked at a few of them with Flextronics and so on, they literally have over 400 computers, right, that's running this assembly line for redundancy, 200, and just keeping them up to date, managing the firmware, you know, all the security violations and things like that is a nightmare. So if you can just get rid of all of that, virtualize it, run it remotely, but process it at the edge, that is like the greatest invention you can bring to IoT to make things simpler, to reduce the amount of data. Some of these offshore oil fields that John was talking about, you know, there's terabytes of data over a 64 kilobit connection. We're doing over a thousand X reduction of data with data in motion, right? That can look for the right events, make the decisions in real time. So it's incredibly powerful. Yeah, maybe just I can add also, I think it's important to understand that fog is not an alternative for cloud, right? Because there, there are use cases, like if you connect yeah. a bunch of uh, vending machines, you can connect them to the cloud directly. Um, because the vending machine will send a couple of packets every couple of days, hey, I'm running out of cans, right? Um, and in some cases, uh, as, as, uh, as the panelists have described, it's much more, um, much more co um, uh, useful to actually process the data as opposed to the source. But even in this case, you would, let's say, run SAP HANA in the cloud and you would send the policy down to the cars or to the rigs to process the data locally. So think of FOG as an extension of the cloud rather than an alternative to the cloud. And so that's uh, important as you're asking about analytics as well, is there's some amount of analytics that are best to do on the edge, closest to the sensors, but there's also another set of analytics that is very good to do in the cloud as we bring bigger amounts or broader range of data together. <coughs> and, um, and the other thing about the analytics is there may be analytics that we run as a service that Cisco does, but obviously it's a big world and there's a lot of analytics, so we're looking for partners and these solutions to come together in the ecosystem for analytics as well. Great. The microphone. Hello. Yeah. This is a tangential to kind of what you're talking about. Um, as you go to the edge, the devices, the sensors, whatever, have one thing in common, they need power. 
and the, that, that becomes the Achilles heel sometimes of IoT. And I want to know, what, what is Cisco doing around power over Wi-Fi? Are you doing any development uh, in that domain and do you know about it right now? Yeah, we're, we're aware of it. We're not doing, it's a very uh, new technology. I mean, you've just seen, you know, some of the PhD students that are working on it. But uh, we are working on power over Ethernet. You still need the wire. And the example that John was talking about for digital lighting or the digital ceiling, the thing is you can centralize it and actually power every camera, every light, every end device, you know, from that central hub and at the same time extract out the analytics. But these things are just going to continue to mature and evolve over time and how you connect and power them, you know, will evolve. And actually, while we're talking about that quickly, let me ask John, um, there's going to be a lot of sensors and actuators. Billions or trillions? Billions. Billions, okay, <laughs> billions. And uh, so as those are out there, as the CTO of Enterprise Networking, how are we going to manage and operate all of those things? Yeah, so the, the life cycle of all these sensors and actuators is really, really important. And as you know, even configuring a small number of devices today is really complicated. So some of the technologies we're developing to basically to manage uh, infrastructure today, like controller managed networks and so forth, those are sort of technologies we're looking to apply to IoT and IoT to once again automate a lot of the configuration operations and, and view the entire life cycle of these of devices. In addition, by doing this, it can dramatically help with a lot of security problems because it can help ensure that we have, as soon as we realize there's an issue with security, to be able to update all the devices uh, right away and also to know which devices have not been updated so we can, or cannot be updated so we can go in and do the right thing. So a lot of the SDN-based and controller-managed technologies we're developing are very important for IoT, IOE. Great. Anything else? Okay, uh, Jose, I believe you had a question, and then we'll have another one in the front here. Yeah, the question that I have is, um, if I'm not mistaken, Cisco's doing something with connecting um, like uh, IP to USB gateway. So for example, that if I can you know, manage my sensors going through the network and getting to the USB sensor through the network, is that something that you're doing? or? So we've, uh, we've built some devices to enable that because um, what happens is that there are tens of thousands of USB devices today, sensors, actuators, so forth, and they don't have Ethernet. So one of the things we wanted to do is, is try to bring those to the Internet, to connect them. And one of the things we've done is a connector which can go from USB to Ethernet with power control and so forth. And if, if you or anybody else is interested, we can provide you more information. Well, our goal is to get rid of those USBs, connect everything. <laughs> Okay, another question up here. I'm sitting here listening to you all feeling very prescient because I've been telling customers for several years now, uh, I've been describing IP networks as sort of the fourth utility. Um, and, and, and this is just really another name for that, and that's really great. I work in the space where I'm dealing with customers that I would refer to as the, the small to mid commercial customer, customers with 150, 200, 300, 500 employees. A lot of what you're speaking of today involves much larger enterprises. Um, talk a little bit about how I go about getting that mid-market customer, that uh, 200, 300, 500 employee customer more excited and to see the opportunities in IoT, IOE. Um, for, for that space. Yep. I would take the first shot on that and say um, and it's, uh, as the world is moving also to new business models like managed services, um, I don't think that a lot of these small and medium businesses want to have the complexity in-house. Uh, so I, I think that's going to be more and more a driver uh, for cloud services, um, either public, either private, hybrid, intercloud and that is we're going to make some announcements uh, at this conference <laughs> i don't know at what time <laughs> but one of, one of these coming days you'll hear more about and that's how we are seeing and how we want to address specifically that group of customers it's an enormous space yep good afternoon Stead Budk, Bell canada um i have a question around education and education gap and what is Cisco doing about it and do you see it as a major constraint? Yeah. Because I can tell you um, this topic comes <laughs> up quite often right now yeah. in, in, in the barbecue yeah. 
around the you know family table. My dad is an electrical contractor. I I understand networks, but I can tell you that last time I did the electrical plug, I had to my lights wouldn't turn off. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if he starts doing grounding and switching, there's a gap there, right? So. It takes time, yeah. and, and it's a really big skill gap from what I see. And you know, how do we trans transform ourselves? And, and yeah. how do I understand building automation systems yeah, and, yeah. and so on? Yeah. I should like to take it that, that Cisco is known for certifications, um, and that we're all proud. Uh, at Cisco Live, we started 20 years ago with networkers. You you don't remember that day. <laughs> You're too young. <laughs> but certifications have made a lot of differentiation. It gives more value to the profession, it attracts talent. Um, so we have started now with the first certification program on the industrial side, specifically manufacturing. Sorry? So that, that's the CCNA certification for a manufacturing industrial engineering. So how are we going to bridge that IT and OT? How are we going to, and it, we already think that there is a skills gap of 2 million people around the world. And so it's an enormous thing to address. Cisco Network Academies are currently developing curriculums had to come up also in Cisco Network Academies for specific programs for the industrial side of the house, manufacturing, smart grid. Tony, I don't know whether you want to explore. Yeah, there is 11 chapters in that curriculum that we're developing for a uh, what we call CPWE, Converged Plant-Wide Ethernet, which is exactly like what John and Kip were talking about. Most of these environments that you walk into, there's like 30 different networks. You collapse it all into a mission-critical network. There's also a consortium called IIPA. You can just go on the net that we're doing it together with Rockwell and a few other partners, and we're trying to educate people about how to bring <coughs> Ethernet and IP into this new connectivity world, right? and there's going to be many more of these things coming out. There's also a consortium that we have with GE and a number of uh, other partners, IIC, Industrial Internet Consortium, that for every one of the top five verticals, we are actually are also trying to provide a reference architecture that if you want to go modernize your plant or build whatever, you don't have to architect it from ground up. We'll give you that architectural blueprint you can build on top of that. So these things are maturing. There's a ton of material out there that we can provide. Yeah. And if I could add on to that, you're in the DevNet zone. Yeah. Uh, part of DevNet is very much about learning and about doing. So if you go over, there's some learning labs that'll go there and teach you a bit about IoT and you know some of the things that you can do there hands-on. Uh, there's also kind of coding 101 classes you know, that have, are hugely popular that we're trying to do to make it easier. And the other thing to realize is that you're not just developing in IoT, you're operating. So there's DevOps for IoT, which very much applies to your father as well. So uh, we'll be bringing those worlds together more. Those are um, available online too. And they're, and they're available online, yes. So he's not here, but we have other things available online. Uh, we are actually at the top of the hour, but what I'm gonna do is just quickly, each of you can give you uh, your last final wisdom, words of wisdom on IoT. Okay. It's a, this is a very exciting area, a very exciting time for us. I think there are going to be huge advancements occurring. And I, I encourage you to go and look at some of the work in demos over here because this will actually maybe lead to you come up with some really creative ideas about new applications and use cases for some specific verticals that could lead to these exponentials. Very exciting time. Thanks, John. IoT will do, uh, redefine your companies and your, uh, your customers and your business. So. What I would encourage you, uh, whatever the term we use, but become this uh, chief IoT officer, become the change agent in your company that will drive the IoT adoption in your company, not only from a technology perspective, but also from the organization and from the people skill set perspective. Great. Yep. Yes, so the way these technologies can be uh, deployed is almost limitless, which is one of the challenges actually with um, talking about it. Um, but as you're looking at the technologies here, Think about the problems that you're aware of in your business or in your customer's business, how you can apply these technologies uh, to solve a problem, generate an ROI or improve safety, and, and then go do it. Uh, the tools are there, it's easy to do, and there's huge value at stake. So I would say it's, it's, it's here, it's now, it's big, and it's bold. Prepare yourself for it. A digitization of a country, a city, a company, a home, eventually your body, will take place in the next three to five years. 
don't be reactive, be preactive. Study, take it as an opportunity. It's going to add three to five percent of GDP growth to the world. It will change a lot of jobs. Don't let it happen to you. Take the lead. And what I would say just to add to a great set of uh, perceptions here is that the winners in the IoT space are going to be the guys that know how to partner. This is bigger than any single company. So if you have a good flexible architecture and a platform that you can easily interoperate and work with different people, which is what really DevNet's all about, that's going to be the key to success, flexibility and speed. Great. And uh, just for me to add a final word, is it's about the ecosystem and it's about kind of the developer experience. There's a project Kip referred to called uh, Project Hello World to help people drag and drop sensors together, put some logic into them to make other things happen. So this doesn't require you to be you know, uh, you know, a five-star programmer, but to be able to operate and develop these environments. So uh, we're all here about really making IoT world real. I think that the panel has believed that we're beyond the hype stage and we're back to the reality stage. So uh, we look forward to working with all of you. And uh, special thanks to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sue.